draw a line, then draw three lines coming off of it, then repeat the same thing on those three lines. If you keep repeating these steps, not only will you have drawn a really beautiful fractal, but you have also drawn something that remarkably resembles a plant. Now, look outside. Don't those leaves and trees look like they've been built using a similar process? It doesn't stop at plants either. Take a look at how our lungs, brains, and kidneys are defined. Don't they look like fractals too? So why does this happen? Why is it that there are a huge portion of living things parts that are built using fractals? Why does life like it so much? Now, this is a very difficult question to answer indeed. I mean, fractals are pretty complicated shapes with many intricate details, aren't they? How does nature manage to fit all of that inside the DNA of an organism? Let's take a step back and look at the true nature of these fractals. How are they defined? How do we generate these fractals? And to fit the theme of biology, we're going to be using cells instead of twigs to make this plant this time. Let's start with a cell. I'll name it B. And B is kind of like our stand-in for a stem cell. It can turn into other cell types. The rule for B is that it can branch two more Bs and turn itself into F. F also has its own rules. F will double itself every generation. If we keep reiterating this, voila, we've made another tree. Have you noticed something? We only needed three short rules to define this fractal and the computer can just reiterate these rules every generation. I'm now going to compact these rules into a definition that computers can read. This way of defining fractals is invented by the theoretical biologist Astrid Lindemeyer. Don't worry, I'll walk you through the basics of it. The cool thing about these is that it can not only describe plant growth, but the fractals you're probably familiar with, like the Sierpinski triangle. All you need to do is state the starting condition, also known as the axiom, and the rules for how the fractal grows. And for every generation, you substitute in the rules in their respective places. The front-facing brackets you see here are really meant for drawing the twig cases. It just tells the drawer to save this position in mind and come back to it once it encounters the back bracket. Negative B means draw B onto the left, and plus B means draw B onto the right. Well, I'm not going to bore you with the rest of the details and rules. I think it's much more fun if you go and try it yourself. Go ahead, go play around and find out with this L system generator online. To me, playing with interactive tools online like this one can be much more enlightening and engaging than simply listening to a lecture. But sometimes, standalone tools can leave you wanting for more but having nowhere to go, and the lessons don't really feel connected. Luckily, thanks to our sponsor today, Brilliant.org, you can simply now do this for free online. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data science, and computer science interactively. Brilliant is fun and interactive, with thousands of lessons from basic to advanced topics and new lessons added every month. Whatever your skill level, Brilliant customizes the content to fit with your needs and lets you solve at your own pace. In this video, I'll talk about how fractals can have infinite length, but also paradoxically have a finite area. If you want to prove it for yourself, I highly encourage you to hop onto their Complex Numbers course, where you'll be guided step by step into unraveling this beautiful mathematical puzzle, almost as if you're the one who came up with it yourself. You'll even get to learn about other cool fractals such as the Mandelbrot and Julia sets. And you can even learn about the cool applications of fractals, such as synthesizing very convincing fake images and textures of nature using fractals. Guess which one is the real image? Beyond fractals, there are tons of topics on Brilliant that longtime viewers of my channel has been exposed to, such as calculus, linear algebra, and neural networks, all of which come with their cool and beautiful interactives. And don't worry, if you can't solve a certain problem, you can always peek at the explanation. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free, for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash nanorooms, or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. See you there! Now, you might have noticed that this very complex shape with such meticulous detail can be simplified into three lines of information. And instead of storing the infinite details of the entire shape, we can just store this recursion formula while taking up much less space. This, in fact, is one of the reasons why living things use fractals as a shape-building strategy. 
This is a part of a concept known as algorithmic complexity. It's a measure of the trade-off between how much space one needs to store information and the time it takes to execute that information. For example, our fractals. As highly detailed as they are, they're very simple from an algorithmic complexity standpoint. I mean, it's just the same shape over and over again. It takes a long time to unravel those rules into shapes, yes, but the rules themselves don't take up much space at all. There is a flip side to this where you can store the shape itself and execute that with little time, but that's not very good for living things as it would require so many unique proteins and molecular machines to be encoded in the DNA, which can cause a bunch of hurdles down the line. You will need to define each part over and over again in the DNA code. The cell can just follow the recursion. In living things, a lot of structures and traits come into existence due to evolutionary pressures. And there is definitely one for fractal shapes. Here's an example of such a pressure. Imagine we have this square block of cells, and we want to design a system that can transport fluids, like air or blood, to every cell. Sure, we can sacrifice a portion of space into plumbing, but that's a huge waste of space and cells. We want to reach every cell with as little volume cost as possible. It all comes down to the nature of fractals. They can span an area or a volume, but they themselves can be lines or simple 2D shapes. Take a look at this Hilbert curve. It fills up space, but it doesn't take away from any operating area significantly. I'd like you to imagine these curves as if they're pipes carrying blood. Can you see how we're able to reach into a majority of these cells without sacrificing much space? We're able to maximize our reach via length without sacrificing too much volume or area in that reach. In fact, you yourself right now is a very good example of this. Your blood vessels, lymphatic system, and lungs also use fractals for a similar trade-off. Our lungs, obviously, aren't constructed like Hilbert curves. This is because the last cell will be at the very bottom of the barrel when it comes to priority. That's why we have this sort of spiked-out fractal instead. This whole part honestly reminds me of a problem in first-year calculus, how one must have an infinite amount of paint to paint the infinite surface area of a shape, but the shape itself is finite in volume. It's really cool how fractals, and as a consequence, life, behave in such a remarkably similar fashion. But perhaps the most fascinating reasons for fractals being ubiquitous in life is found by delving into the nitty-gritty details. How does a living thing know how to form the lung shape? Where does this code we saw in the first section get encoded in the DNA? And of course, biologists don't want to experiment with humans, so we use fruit flies and rat rats instead. Flies don't exactly have lungs. Instead, they use their trachea to deliver oxygen. However, like lungs, they are fractal shaped. Let's skip ahead to when the fly is an embryo. The trachea has its humble beginnings. It's initially just a pipe that stretches through the entire body. Suddenly, a few lumps pop out of the main tube. This is where our trachea branches will grow. On each of these cells, there are direction sensors called rathless, and these sense a molecule named branchless. So, well, why is this important? Around the trachea, there are a bunch of cells that make and send out branchless. Once the cells get a whiff of this, they move towards the source of the signal, and that is how we make our primary branch of the trachea. Once they get near the signal cells, the signal gets very strong, and the tip cells start kicking into gears for the secondary branching process. The cells warp and contort into tubes, making our secondary branch. The tip cells also make a bunch of molecules. It's called sprouty, and these inhibit other cells down the line from branching. The tip cells also turn off the signal cells when they're too close. This can sometimes result in the primary branch sneaking its way towards another source cell. The branching beyond this level is very loosely patterned, as the sensors are now able to pick up oxygen. This mechanism is still governed by the same two genes, branchless and breathless. The same idea also applies to mice lungs, except the patterns are a little bit different. And after looking at how all of this works in detail, you might think, wait, there's no L system or fractal gene strictly encoded anywhere. There's one gene set that controls the branching, but there are more conditions governing the recursion. We're not directly copying and pasting these branches. 
each layer is unique in the way that they branch. But why? Why add this layer of complexity? Isn't it a waste of DNA space to have so many genes doing repeated tasks? What about the algorithmic complexity argument in the first section? Well, life isn't perfect. If we have encoded just self-similar fractals, it's like having a controller that can't feed back on itself. Imagine if the body is slightly deformed mid-growth, we would have no way to feed back and correct that error. It would just cause a mess of growth. This design is much more moldable and adaptable to environment, internal or external. This design philosophy has a name. It's called modularity. This idea of modularity doesn't just apply to branching motifs. It's not even limited to growth response to the environment. Let's look at how shrimp flippers are defined. It depends on which one of these Hox genes are present. Shout out to the previous episode. Having these two genes, abdominal A and abdominal B, activated at the same time in the same segment produces flippers, while without abdominal B, it becomes walking legs. Now, imagine if there's a mutation that gets rid of one of these flippers. If this mutation proves favorable, this mutant will be more readily selected to reproduce. You don't have to redesign the whole leg, you can just swap the activations. Isn't that an incredible evolutionary strategy? And of course, this doesn't just apply to shrimp. They also apply to a vast majority of animals, even us humans. Well, yes, it might be disappointing that the essence of how life is built isn't fully based on beautiful, idealized, and perfect self-similar fractals. Well, if that were true, life would be incredibly stagnant and unadaptable. On the other hand, if life had no pattern or organization at all, it would also be equally hard to evolve and change. There'd be a need to define every single part, even for the mundane details. What's pretty cool though, is that life defines its parts recursively. This means that it can change bits and pieces without having to redo the entire thing just to get a new trait. It's in this delicate balance between adaptability and self-similarity that we discover one of life's most remarkable strategies that allows it to thrive amidst the unpredictable and diverse conditions of this earth, all of that at astonishing speeds. It's quite poetic that the perfect and beautiful fractals we've seen in living things are actually a reflection into their readiness for imperfection. Thank you immensely for watching.